You know, I started this with the ambition of maybe doing two books per video, because I did that with the first two, but I don't, I honestly at this point don't think that's going to be possible. Uh, so I think we're probably just going to keep it at one book or per video, and if some of these videos might have been a little shorter as a result, so be it. Uh, Lord knows the first couple have been more than long enough, and this one's probably going to be as well. Lots of stuff to break down in book four. In fact, I'll be honest with you. I feel like at this point through four books, we could go back, reread these four first four books, do a completely different set of videos, and talk about just about none of the same material and have everything be just as long. There, there's so much here. And once again, I feel like what I have prepared for you with my notes tonight is hopefully going to be interesting to you, hopefully going to be useful for your own reading of the poem. Uh, but it's just going to leave so much by the wayside in terms of what we could be covering here. So, uh, by no means consider this exhaustive, and who knows, maybe somewhere down the road I'll do another round of Paradise Lost videos and pick up some of the stuff we didn't talk about this time. Uh, but where I actually want to start today is a little clarification back for Book 3. So, we talked a little bit at the end of the last video about Milton's view on the Trinity. Uh, specifically, I mentioned a couple things during the last video. The first was that unless we were to interpret the invocation of the Muse as being a reference to the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is persona non grata in heaven during this whole scene and conversation that we get during the first portion of Book 3. You know, we see the Father and the Son there, but we don't see the Holy Spirit at all. And I noted that that was very curious. And then I also noted that Milton almost seems to be, or possibly even more than almost, uh, seems to be embracing Arianism, the belief that the Father and the Son are not equal, that, that the Son is below the Father in a way that would violate the traditional Orthodox understanding of the Trinity held by pretty much all Christians everywhere, you know, Protestant, Catholic, Orthodox is one of the great things we all agree on, and Milton seems not to here. So that was a little curious, and uh, I was really pleased that uh, one of you out there, uh, Jordan, actually sent me an email. He dug, he did a little research on this, and he dug into Milton's, uh, I'm going to butcher the name now, I forget what he said, it's De Doctrina Christiana, uh, something like uh, doc, Christian Doctrine or something like that, which is uh, apparently I did a little more research beyond what Jordan had sent me on this. It's a manuscript that was found in the 19th century, and it's not 100% def definitive that Milton wrote it, but people are pretty sure. The majority of scholars would say, yes, this is absolutely Milton. So I, I think we can go ahead and say, yeah, this is being written by Milton, and just maybe have that slight caveat that, you know, with all historical documents like that, there isn't. But uh, Jordan sent me a few quotes, and I, I want to read a couple of them uh, from this book, you know, on Christian doctrine that, that Milton wrote. And the first one he says, and this is in reference to 1 Corinthians 15:27. He says, it is expressly declared that when the Son shall have completed his functions as mediator, and nothing shall remain to prevent him from resuming his original glory as only begotten Son, he shall nevertheless be subject unto the Father. A little later on, talking about the Holy Spirit, although the Holy Spirit may be, be nowhere said to have taken upon himself any mediatorial functions, as it is said of Christ, nor to be engaged by the obligations of a filial relationship to a relation to pay obedience to the Father, yet he must evidently be considered as inferior to both Father and Son. Now, the language in that first quote, subject, is used in that passage to refer to the Son, and we could, I mean, that one we could excuse him on, because there is understanding within Trinitarian doctrine of hierarchy, 
that the son does submit himself to the father, but they are equal. Okay, yeah, very confusing. We're not talking about Trinitarian doctrine here. Uh, so if that doesn't quite make sense, just roll with it. You know, so that doesn't necessarily violate it. The, the tone that Milton's saying that in sounds suspicious. But the second you say that one of the members of the Trinity is inferior to one or both of the others, you have now wandered off the reservation of Orthodox Christian theology. And then one final quote I want to read from what Jordan sent me. He says, wherever similar phrases are applied to the Son of God, in which he is distinctly declared to be inferior to the Father, they ought to be understood in reference to his divine as well as to his human character. So traditional Christian theology would acknowledge at least to some degree that the humanity of Jesus is inferior to the Father. Remember we talked about Jesus and the Son, how we have to kind of you know, Jesus is the incarnate Son in human flesh. The Son is eternal God. Uh, so Jesus, incarnate man, inferior to the Father, submissive to the Father. The Son is not. But Milton's saying, no, those references would include both Jesus, the incarnate man, and the Son. So uh, this is great stuff, Jordan. He sent me a, uh, another couple quotes um, that kind of just continue on that theme. Uh, really solid stuff, and I think really backs up what we were seeing in book three. So I think it's safe to say that whatever Milton's understanding of the Trinity was, it was at the very least on the fringes of orthodoxy and quite possibly would wander into what most Christians would consider to be heretical territory. Okay. That doesn't mean that this isn't a great poem. Of course it is. Uh, but I think that's important for our understanding of it. Whatever you think of, you know, if you're a Christian or not, and whatever you think of the Trinity, like, this isn't theology class, but uh, it's important that we understand where Milton's thought is coming from if we're to totally un enter into the world of the poem. Okay. So book four is really, we, we can maybe divide this into a few different parts say four different parts. We have first, you know, remember where we left Satan is that he had tricked Uriel into showing him the way to Eden, but he isn't quite on his way yet. We, we start with Satan in kind of a contemplative moment, looking from heaven to Eden. Then we have his flight to Eden. We have some observances of Adam and Eve in Eden, and then we have a confrontation with Gabriel uh, that, that rounds out the book. And I think that where most of our discussion is going to be is actually in this first part. You know, I have stuff to say on all of these, all four areas of this book. Uh, but I found this first part where Satan is contemplating heaven and Eden to be especially worth our time and especially deep and provocative. But before we get there, I do want to start with uh, the be very beginning of the book. So this is lines one through five. Milton starts his book saying, Oh, for that warning voice which he who saw the apocalypse. Now that's a reference to John and the book of Revelation. Okay, so the, what we would call the book of Revelation may also be called at times in the Christian tradition the Apocalypse, the Apocalypse of St. John, the Revelation of St. John. Just understand that our titles for the various books of the Bible are fluid. So here we're definitely referencing uh, Revelation and John. Oh, for that warning voice which he who saw the Apocalypse heard cry in heaven aloud that when the dragon put to second rout came furious down to be revenged on men, Woe to the inhabitants of earth. So, a couple things going on here. First, obviously we're leading up, we're getting closer to the temptation moment. We're not going to get there in this book, uh, nor in the next few, I believe. But we're getting closer there. And Melton's saying, oh, if only we'd had that warning voice as we did, uh, you know, as we saw in the book of Revelation. But I think even more than that, Milton is specifically invoking the book of Revelation. In fact, little later on, as he moves past this kind of intro, but is still sort of in it, there's a line about 
Satan, the hell within him, for within him hell. And I think that's a, or all, that could also be, uh, maybe could be a reference to Revelation 6, 8, where John's viewing the four horsemen of the apocalypse and the famous line and hell followed with him you know so there's this very apocalyptic language to open this book and that's important for us and that's something we could easily misunderstand as um modern thinkers because in our language and our thinking now apocalypse has come to mean the end of the world you know nuclear war or what have you, everybody wiped out, the zombie apocalypse, you know, that, those are the ways we use it. But really in more of a classical understanding, and especially in a biblical understanding, apocalypse is less that and more a turning point in history, okay? So from a biblical perspective, the ultimate apocalyptic moment is the death and resurrection of Christ, okay? But certainly here as well, we are merging into an apocalyptic moment with the fall of man. We need to see that as a turning point of history. One of those moments that all of history leads up to and all of history flows out of. And that's why we say the same thing about Christ. And, you know, that you can see how that comes to then mean the end of the world, you know, what all of history is leading up to. Of course, that's an apocalyptic moment in and of itself, but the apocalypse is not merely the end of the world. It is rather those seminal moments. And Milton wants to signal us right from the book that we are heading to the apocalypse right now. Not in our modern understanding, but within a biblical and classical understanding of what that concept is. The other thing I want to point out here at the beginning, as possible reference to the Iliad, I think it's significant that in line 9, Milton makes a reference to Satan now first inflamed with rage. And this could be, to continue our ongoing dialogue about, is Satan the hero of Paradise Lost? Well, if this is a reference to the Iliad, it ties him very closely to Achilles. Because what's the Iliad about, right? If you haven't read it, but you kind of know the story, you might be mistaken in thinking that the Iliad is about the fall of Troy. It is not. Most people who come to the Iliad with that impression walk away being very confused because the infamous wooden Trojan horse never makes an appearance and the walls of Ilium are well and good once we reach the final line of the Iliad. So what is the Iliad about? Well, the Iliad is about, and we find this out at the very beginning of the book, uh, with the invocation of the muse, the Iliad is about the rage of Achilles. Okay? Achilles gets pissed off at Agamemnon. He goes and quits the war, essentially. The Trojans get their, or not, excuse me, the Greeks get their butts kicked by the Trojans. And then it's about how Achilles is then brought back into the war, eventually kills Hector, his friend Patroclus dies, we get this amazing scene where King Priam of the, the Trojans comes and speaks to Achilles, asking him for Hector's body, and the book ends with the funeral rites for Hector and Patroclus. So that's what the Iliad's about, not the, not the fall of Troy. And so it's about the rage of Achilles. And so I, I kind of think maybe and maybe this is, it might be a stretch, and I might be completely wrong here, but given how many ties to the Iliad and, and Greek mythology we've seen so far, it wouldn't surprise me if Milton is, by specifically signaling Satan's rage, that, that's a very key word for the Iliad, rage. So there may very well be a tie there. Okay, so we start this book then, after this introductory stuff, with Satan contemplating what he's going to do. He's sitting there, he sees heaven and the sun over here, he sees Eden over here. Uh, there's a line about how his gaze goes from one to the other. You know, he's contemplating, what do I do now? And we get a very moving scene, and I'm going to read quite extensively from some of Satan's monologue uh, here at the beginning of the book. So Satan finds himself contemplating 
of all things, repentance. As he observes heaven and he remembers his fall. Now this is fascinating because book three, we've already had established that God says there will be no repentance for Satan and the other fallen angels. That's been closed off to them. And what's interesting here is that what we're going to see through this monologue of Satan is that even though he doesn't know that, he sees repentance as a possibility and he rejects it. And so Milton's going to do this a couple times. We're going to see this again at the beginning of the next book, uh, tied to something we see in this book, and I'll talk about that more in the next video. Uh, but this whole idea of that Milton closes something off, but then shows us that even if that thing hadn't been closed off, it still would have been futile. So here, repentance for Satan has been closed off, but even if it wasn't, it wouldn't have made any difference. So it's a very moving moment here uh, at the beginning of the book. And, you know, I, I think as we, we read through some of this, forget for a second that we're talking about Satan and, and think of him as a tragic literary character because this is just powerful writing. So I, I have an extensive piece to read here from lines 37 to 74, and I'll kind of pause and make sure we don't get lost along the way, because I know the language can be difficult and dense and everything. So this is Satan speaking here. O sun, looking at the actual sun, which here is a the embodiment of heaven. O sun, to tell thee how I hate thy beams that bring to my remembrance from what state I fell, how glorious once above thy sphere, tell pride and worse ambition threw me down. Very, oh, stop right there. What does Satan blame for his fall? Not God. He blames his pride and ambition. Now, he's not quite blaming himself, you know, pride and ambition, but this is a, you know, he kind of divorces them from himself a little bit with his language. But this is a shocking moment of self-awareness here for the character. Warring in heaven against heaven's matchless king, ah, wherefore, he deserved, meaning God deserved, no such return from me. God didn't deserve what I gave him. He deserved no such return from me, whom he created, what I was in that bright eminence, and with his good upbraided none, nor was his service hard. What could be less than to afford him praise, the easiest recompense, and pay him thanks? How do? And that's D-U-E there. How do? In other words, God made me. He made me glorious. He, he, and all he asked back was praise, and how could I not give that to him? Of course I should have given that to him. I mean, this is stunning here, what, what Milton is drawing out of this universally reviled character, right? Yet all his good proved ill in me and wrought but malice, lifted up so high, I deigned subjection, and thought one step higher would set me highest, and in a moment quit the debt immense of endless gratitude. In other words, he had the pride, God set him high, he wanted to be higher, he, and so he quit paying God what he's already acknowledged is his due. So burdensome, still pain, still to owe, forgetful what from him I still received, and now we're getting even closer to self-awareness here. It's that I'm forgetful. I'm forgetful for what God has done for me. Okay. Oh, what burden, or, or let me back up. Uh, forgetful of what from him I still received and understood not that a grateful mind by owing owes not, but still pays at once, indebted and discharged. What burden then? In other words, even though God wanted this from me, really, if I'd had the right attitude, it wouldn't have been a debt. It wouldn't have seemed like a debt. I didn't actually owe him anything. Oh, had his powerful destiny ordained me some inferior angel. I had stood then happy. No unbounded hope had raised ambition. Now, 
here we do start to go, well, maybe it is God's fault. He made me a little too powerful. He made me too close. Uh, it gave me too much ambition. But then we back off from that. Yet why not? Some other power as great might have aspired and me thought mean drawn to his part. But other powers as great fell not, but stand unshaken from within or from without to all ten temptations armed. In other words, he then acknowledges, well, maybe if I was lower and somebody else had rebelled, I still might have gone to, to the rebellion. But even if that's not the case, if there were angels as powerful as me who didn't rebel. Thou hadst... Or, uh, 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 hang on, I can't, I'm sorry, I keep getting a little lost on where I leave off. Hadst thou the same free will and power to stand, in other words, those angels created uh, as powerful as him, did they have the same free will as him? Thou hadst, yes, they did. Whom hast thou then, or what to accuse, but heaven's free love dealt equally to all. Be then his love accursed, since love or hate to me alike, it deals eternal woe. Nay, cursed be thou, since against his thy will chose freely what it now so justly rues me miserable. That is a heartbreaking monologue there. As Satan has this incredible moment of self-awareness that he has no one to blame here but himself and that he chooses hate only because love in his mind, brings him nothing. So he rejects repentance. He, he rejects this endless debt of gratitude owed to the Father. And then he decides to fly from heaven. This picks up on the very next line, line 75. Which way I fly is to hell. Myself am hell. And in the lowest deep, a lower deep, still threatening to devour me, opens wide. To which the hell I suffer seems a heaven. Now, this somewhat echoes some of the speeches in Book 2, where I forget which demon it was, but the one who said, well, you know, there was, uh, was it Belial? I think it was Belial who was uh, the one representing Sloth, who was saying, you know, let's not do anything because things could actually get much worse for us, us than they are right now. And Satan's kind of echoing this, that, you know, things are going to fall even farther than they've already fallen. Oh, then, at last relent, is there no place left for repentance, none for pardon left? And this is his final moment. This is where he asks himself, can I repent? None left but by submission. And that word, disdain, forbids me. Complete rejection of repentance. Even if it was there, he rejects it. And then the scene ends with this final Tragic note, beginning in line 108. So farewell hope, and with hope farewell fear, farewell remorse, all good to me is lost. Evil be thou my good, by thee at least divided empire with heaven's king I hold. By thee and more than half perhaps will reign, as man ere long in this new world shall know. So... I mean, just just take a minute, and, and if it's too hard to follow reading out loud, you know, pause the video and go get your copy of Milton's Paradise Lost and, and reread that whole monologue, you know, and just really think about what he does with the character of Satan there. Just this incredible, heart-wrenching journey from this kind of moment of self-realization where Satan realizes... Oh crap, what have I done? And whose fault is it? And he considers all these options and it's his fault. And can I repent? And he comes to the conclusion, which we know from book three happens to be incorrect, but he doesn't know that. I can repent. I can go submit. No. So evil be thou, my good, and farewell to hope, and farewell to fear, which is absolutely chilling. I mean, if that monologue doesn't do anything for you, just close the book. <laughs> you know, if that doesn't just awe you with the brilliance of Milton's thought, of his ability to 
just wrench every last bit of power and emotion from these passages. Just, just give up now. You, you shouldn't be reading Paradise Lost if that doesn't do it for you. Or maybe don't give up. Maybe search yourself and figure out uh, what's preventing you from really being able to embrace this poem. Because that is just stunning. Just absolutely incredible. All right, so let me move on to the flight to Eden. And Eden is portrayed, and, and I owe a debt of gratitude to, uh, I'm reading C.S. Lewis's uh, preface to Paradise Lost right now, and he points out that we're supposed to see Eden as this isolated and hidden place. That it's far, far up. He em uh, Milton emphasizes how Satan keeps going up and up and up. And even when he thinks he's at the top of the tallest trees, it's Eden is farther beyond that. So it's isolated, it's remote, it's protected. It's quiet. It's peaceful. You know, and then we, we get to the garden and we find that there's one gate that looks east. And of course, the whole Adam and Eve being kicked out east of Eden uh, is foreshadowed here. That they are going to be exiting from that gate before too long. And then we get this moment where Satan hops the gate. And here the imagery and the language is taken uh, directly from John 10. Uh, specifically, this is the whole passage of I am the good shepherd and, you know, and the thief doesn't enter by the gate and he comes to steal, kill, and destroy. And it, it's worth reading that to understand the context of what's going on here. And it's also significant, I want to point this out for any C.S. Lewis Narnia fans, that in Magician's Nephew, which is kind of the, the prequel to the whole Narnia series, where we within Lewis's world, the fall is reenacted within Narnia, this same scene plays out almost exactly where the Eden location is remote and far away and top of a mountain and the satanic figure hops the fence and enters it and not by the gate. And so there, it's a fascinating scene from that perspective that we both look back into the biblical reference but can also look forward into what and to Lewis's own homage to this scene. Okay, so, so Satan's in Eden now, and he lands on the Tree of Life. Very obvious symbolism, death has landed on the Tree of Life. Um, but just because it's obvious and on the nose doesn't make it any less powerful. You know, this is a, this is a very striking symbol, that where does Satan choose to watch Adam and Eve from? Well, he chooses to watch them from the tree of life, from the very promise of their continued existence. And so symbolically here we have the tension of that choice. Life versus temptation, sin versus righteousness. You know, all these symbols are becoming very closely entwined as we move closer and closer to that temptation moment. And then he spies on them. Now, I think it's important to stop here and acknowledge that Milton's portrayal of Eve is probably not the most palatable to modern ears. And that's going to continue on through the remainder of the poem. And I'd like to suggest there's maybe three ways that we can take that. I think we could take it as that Milton's just a misogynist. Uh, he doesn't like Eve, you know, so she gets the short end of the stick. I think we could say it's a product of his time. Obviously, way, way, way pre-feminism. Uh, or we could say it's theological, that within the biblical narrative, and Paul makes a point of pointing this out in one of his epistles, that it is Eve who eats the apple first, and so we need to set that up narratively. Uh, and I don't necessarily want to take a definitive position on which one of those it is, except to say two things. Number one, I think it's worth being generous with our interpretations. On, on things like this. If we set out to be offended, we'll probably be offended. Now, that doesn't mean you have to agree with everything Milton says. I mean, I don't agree with his position on the Trinity. Uh, you know, they're, they're, I don't agree with, with his Protestantism. I'm a Catholic, you know, so there's any number of things like that that we could find in the text we don't agree with. Uh, but let's not set out to be offended, I guess would be my, my one caution. And then the second thing I would say is that I think that whenever you're reading something like this, it is important to enter into 
the world of the poem and the world of the author. Now that's a trickier point because there are a number of interpretations of poems like this that could be valuable. I think, you know, there's nothing wrong with a feminist reading of classical literature. In fact, it can be very, very helpful. And a feminist reading would probably focus largely on what Milton has to say about Eve. And it'll probably discuss in a not very flattering light. But nevertheless, we need to be willing to enter into Milton's thought if we're going to understand the poem, even if we want to critique it, okay? So to go back to the Trinity, what I was talking about at the beginning, for the purposes of, of reading Paradise Lost, it doesn't matter what you believe about the Trinity. It's important to understand what Milton believes so that you can enter into his thought and therefore understand the poem. And then, if you want to take the next step from there and critique his position on the Trinity, that's completely appropriate. But there's something very different from that, you know, taking the time to first understand and enter in and then, or simply coming with guns blazing, saying, Milton is anti-Jesus, you know, and so we're going to attack, attack, attack. Uh, and I think the same thing applies here, that if we just come into the attitude of that bastard Milton is anti-woman, attack, 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 uh, we're not going to... We're not going to have the right attitude with critiquing this poem. If rather, we try to understand what is Milton's thought here regarding Eve, both as a product of a time, as maybe his personal views, and then especially his theology, uh, and then critique it, if that's something we feel compelled to do. That's what I, I would encourage. Okay, so putting all that aside, within the world of the poem, it is important to recognize here that Eve is seen already as the weak link. So we get this whole scene that directly ties Eve to Narcissus, right? Narcissus, the figure in, in ancient mythology, who sees himself, he sees his reflection in the pool of water and falls in love with himself, hence the term narcissistic, which is quite a relevant one to much of our culture today. Um, and Eve repeats that scene almost word for word. So this is Eve talking, beginning in line 456. I thither went with unexperienced thought and laid me down on the green bank to look into the clear, smooth lake that to me seemed another sky. As I bent down to look, just opposite a shape within the watery gleam appeared, bending to look on me. I stared back. It stared back. Of course, she's looking at her reflection here within the pool. Uh, but pleased, I soon returned. Pleased, it returned as soon with answering looks. Or, excuse me, I, I'm sorry, I'm not doing a good job of reading my own notes here. So, let's see, where did I... Uh, I stared back. It's... Oh, I read that wrong. Okay, let me start over a little bit. So a shape within the watery gleam appeared, bending to look on me. I started back, it started back, but pleased I soon returned. Okay, Cle cleared that out. Pleased it returned as soon with answering looks of sympathy and love. There I had fixed mine eyes till now, and pinned with vain desire, pined with vain desire, had not a voice thus warned me what thou seest. What there thou seest, fair creature, is thyself. With thee it came and goes, but follow me, and I will bring thee where no shadow stays, thy coming and thy soft embraces. He whose image thou art, him thou shalt enjoy, inseparable thine, to him shall bear multitudes like thyself, and thence be called mother of human race. So Eve does not sin here. This is very, very important that what Eve does, she does out of innocence, she does out of naivety, she does out of not understanding what a reflection is, okay? You know, give her a break, she's the first, you know, the second human on Earth at this point. And she's called out of that back to her calling, to God, to Adam, to her role as mother of humanity. Oh, no harm, no foul, right? Well, but at the same time, there's a level of that even though it isn't sin, she gives into this narcissism. There's a, a, an element of pride here that I think we are supposed to tie to Satan's own pride with his fall. Okay? And so we're supposed to see that the seeds are there for her fall. She has not fallen. She did nothing wrong. But the elements are there that will eventually cause her to fall. Okay? 
So then Satan keeps watching them. He's nice and voyeuristic. And then he learns of the prohibition against eating uh, from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And he questions it. And the questioning here is very fascinating. He says, beginning in line 516, Why should their Lord envy them that, meaning eating of the tree of knowledge? Can it be sin to know? Can it be death? And do they only stand by ignorance? Is that their happy state and proof of their obedience and their faith? These are very fascinating questions and very, very deep theological questions. I mean, think about the story. You know, it is troubling from a theological perspective to a certain degree that why does God prohibit knowledge within the story? The biblical narrative, I mean, and within this narrative. What's going on there? You know, and so these are important theological questions, and it's one of those moments, I think, where we are tempted to say, and maybe even are right to say, maybe Satan has a little bit of a point here. Maybe there is something fishy about this prohibition. You know, is there life going to be drawn from ignorance? Is that what the life of humanity and the strength of humanity is going to be based on? Now, answering those questions, of course, would be a much longer theological discussion. I don't really want to get into that at the moment. But I think it is worth noting that, again, Satan's not asking bad questions here. Right? He's not completely off his rocker. All right. So, the final thing that happens here is that we, uh, you know, as the scene shifts to Uriel and Uriel kind of figures out he's been duped, we, we get this sort of sexual encounter between Adam and Eve. And this is important because Milton's theology continues to be surprising that unlike so much of Western Christianity, it's non-dualistic. You know, the flesh is not painted as bad and sexuality is not painted as bad by Milton. So Adam and Eve get it on and uh, Milton gives them the thumbs up. So line 741. Nor turned I win Adam from his spare, fair spouse, nor Eve the rites mysterious of connubial love refused, whatever hypocrites austerely talk of purity and place and innocence, defaming that as impure what God declares pure and commands to some leaves free to all. Our maker bids increased, who bids abstain, but our destroyer foe to God and man. So... You know, part of what Milton may be combating here is a puritanical view of sex, even though I think that, in my opinion, that's been a bit mythologized by modern views of the Puritans. Uh, but nevertheless, certainly you see strains of that throughout church history of sex bad, don't do it. You know, and even uh, amusingly enough, sex and cults, sex meaning S-E-C-T-S in the way I'm using it at the moment, sex and cults uh, emerge at various points as offshoots of Christianity that condemn sex, S-E-X, and uh, shockingly enough, they don't tend to last very long, right? They, they last about one generation, I wonder why. But be that as it may, even among Christians who don't go to that extreme, there is that tension that exists throughout uh, church history, and you can see examples of it today. And Milton, again, surprises us, you know, that we can't quite pin him down. Is he uh, the arch-conservative? Is he theologically wild? You know, is he a, a heretic? I mean, he's all over the map theologically. Uh, and, and it's a very fascinating thing to observe, I think, and we'll continue to observe it and point out some of those oddities and uh, strong positions he comes up with. Okay, final scene then, as we come to the end of book four. We get this kind of almost fight between Gabriel and Satan. So Gabriel finds Satan, he tracks him down, they get ready to fight, Satan's ready to do it, and then uh, we get this very curious scene that I, I'm not going to pretend I understand. I don't understand this. I have some thoughts on it, I have some possibilities. I've done a little reading on it, but I don't understand what happens here completely. Is that God makes golden scales appear in the sky. He's weighing the fates. I mean, this much I understand that this is a very clear reference to Zeus and the Iliad uh, and again in the Aeneid of weighing the fates, right? 
you know, so if Satan and Satan sees that uh, if he fights, it's going to go bad, and his better choice is to flee. So there's a lot of possibilities here for what does this mean. Of course, Satan does decide to run away. You know, could God be mocking Satan at Locke? You don't have a chance. Yeah. Uh, is it a commentary on the futility of evil and the power of God? Maybe. Is it a commentary on predestination? Maybe. Is it meant as mercy towards Satan? You know, is God letting him off the hook to a certain degree here? Maybe. Uh, I don't know what to make of this. I mean, it's a very curious symbol that, in a sense, if they fight, Adam and Eve are off the hook because Satan's going to get his butt kicked and sent back to hell. So what do we make of this? I honestly don't know. Uh, I don't think it's predestination because that's been flat out rejected in book three. I don't know. I don't know. I would love to hear any thoughts from you guys on the golden scales. I think that those other things, uh, you know, the mockery of Satan, the futility of evil, the power of God, the you know, mercy, those are all possibilities. None of them is entirely satisfactory to me. Uh, you know, I did a little reading on this. A lot of places, notes I found, advocated the power of God interpretation. I just don't know. Uh, nothing quite fits perfectly for me. But anyway, that is the end of book four and the end of this analysis. Uh, I hope you are enjoying the videos. I hope even more that you are actually reading Paradise Lost and enjoying it uh, as much as I am. And I'll be back next week sometime with the book five analysis. So that is all for now. I'm out of here. I am Bendy Bono and this is the Sci-Fi Christian. Goodbye.